Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston. Welcome to lecture 29 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to look at something called linear dependence and independence of sets of vectors. And to motivate what the idea here is, let's go back to an example that we saw in the previous lecture video. Okay, we learned that the range of this matrix over here, this matrix A, we learned that it is equal to the span of these three vectors here, but it's also equal to the span of just one vector, okay? Because these two extra vectors sort of didn't contribute anything new. Well, linear dependence, it sort of captures that idea of some vectors in a span being redundant, okay? It captures the idea that we don't actually need the vector three, six, or the vector minus four, minus eight here. We would say that this set of vectors is linearly dependent, so we can throw away something from it without actually altering the span. And in particular, we can throw away these two vectors, and when we do, we get this set down here that contains just the vector one, two, which is linearly independent, okay? There's nothing left that we can throw away without altering the span, okay? So it sort of captures the idea of some vectors in a set being redundant and not contributing a not contributing anything new to linear combinations. Okay, we've also seen something like this with systems of linear equations. For example, if we had a linear sy system of linear equations that had this augmented matrix form, then we would solve that linear system by doing row operations to it. In particular, we would do row two plus row one, and we would get this reduced row echelon form. Okay, and the fact that we got this zero row down at the bottom here that sort of signals to us that even though there are two equations in this linear system, in other words, two rows in the matrix, well, one of them doesn't actually contribute anything new. One of them is redundant, okay? Again, that's the idea that linear dependence captures. It captures the idea of some vectors or equations being redundant, not actually contributing anything new to, you know, the span or the linear system or whatever linear algebraic thing it is that we're talking about. Okay, and in particular for this linear system here, right, if we actually write out what the linear system corresponding to this augmented matrix is, the top equation says x minus y equals 2, and the bottom equation says minus x plus y equals minus 2. Okay, and the point is this bottom equation, we didn't actually need it because it doesn't actually tell us anything new. Okay, if we forgot entirely about this bottom equation, we would get the exact same solution set because the bottom equation, you can get it from the top equation. It's just the negative of the top equation. Okay, so it doesn't contribute anything new. All right, so that's the idea here. So this is the big definition for today's class, okay? We say that a set of vectors is linearly dependent if, well, okay, so again, the idea is that means the set, it's redundant in some sense. There's at least one vector that doesn't contribute anything new to the span, okay? So it's linearly dependent if there exists some linear combination of them that equals the zero vector, okay? If you can find some linear combination of those vectors that equals the zero vector. And then wait, there's a little technicality we have to throw in there because you could always find some linear combination that equals the zero vector. You could throw a zero here for C1 and zero for C2 and so on up to zero for CK. All, if you just set all of those coefficients to be zero, then yay, I found a linear combination that's the zero vector. But that's sort of not interesting, okay? So we actually say, hey, we need to find a linear combination with coefficients at least one of which is not zero, okay? So that's the important piece here, okay? You need that technicality here, otherwise everything's degenerate, everything's linearly dependent. Okay, so if you can find a linear combination that's not just the trivial zero linear combination that equals zero, then you say that set's linearly dependent. Okay, if you cannot find a linear combination like this, then you say that the set is linearly independent, okay? And roughly speaking, that means that each vector gives you a new dimension. Each vector is pointing in a really different direction than, than all of the previous vectors, okay? There's sort of no redundancies there. Each one gives you sort of genuinely new information. Each one contributes something non-trivial to the span of those vectors. Okay, so for example, Let's uh, consider the set 2, 3, 1, 0, 0, 1. Is that set linearly dependent or linearly independent? So can we find a linear combination of that, those three vectors that equals the zero vector using not all zero coefficients? Okay, and hopefully it doesn't take too long to see just because, you know, I construct, I, I let the set, the second and third vectors in the set be not too complicated. I mean, this set here, it's linearly dependent because, I mean, you can just take this vector and subtract multiples of these other vectors off of it to get back to the zero vector, all right? So more specifically, yeah, that's linearly dependent because, well, two, three minus two times one, zero minus three times zero, one, yeah, that equals the zero vector. So we, find, we found some non-trivial linear combination of these three vectors that equals the zero vector. That means linear dependence. 
Okay, and again, the idea here is, I mean, if you were considering the span of these three vectors, you could throw something away without altering the span. And I mean, yeah, I, you could forget about this vector 2, 3. It doesn't contribute anything to the span. Because if you just take the span of these two vectors on the right, you already get all of R2. You already get the entire space that they live in. All of two-dimensional space. You don't need the vector 2, 3. It's sort of redundant. It's just a combination of these other two vectors. All right. On the other hand, if we consider the set 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, in other words, the set containing the three standard basis vectors in three-dimensional space, that set is linearly independent. Okay, so let's show this. Let's see how we show that a set is linearly independent. Well, we start off similar to how we show linear dependence, right? Okay, you construct a linear combination of those vectors and set it equal to the zero vector. And your goal this time, because we're trying to show linear independence, we're trying to show that, hey, if this happens, then C1, C2, and C3 must all be the zero, must all be zeros, right? That's the only way to get the zero vector as a linear combination. Okay, so let's just simplify on the left-hand side. C1 times this vector puts a C1 in the first entry. C2 times that vector puts a C2 in the second entry. And C3 times that vector puts C3 in the third entry. And that's got to equal the zero vector on the right-hand side. In other words, well, C1's got to equal zero, C2's got to equal zero, and C3's got to equal zero. Just match up entries. And so, yeah, if this linear combination equals the zero vector, then, yeah, all of the coefficients in the linear combination have to equal zero. So linearly independent is the conclusion that we get from there. There's no non-trivial linear combination that gives you the zero vector. In other words, those three vectors, they're really all pointing in different directions, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, one of them's pointing in the positive x direction, one of them's pointing in the positive y direction, and then one of them's pointing in the positive z direction. They're all sort of giving you a new dimension is the intuition here. Alrighty, and in general, you follow the same procedure to show that a set is linearly independent, okay? What you do is you set up this linear combination, right? V1, V2, up to Vk, those are the vectors that are given to you. And if you want to show that they're linearly independent or linearly dependent, you set up a linear combination of them, set it equal to zero, and then one of two things is gonna happen, okay? One thing that might happen is you get a unique solution. And if, if, if there is a unique solution, I mean it must be the all zero solution. It must be C1 is zero, C2 is zero, up to Ck is zero. If that happens, well, that means linearly independent, right? Okay. On the other hand, another thing that might happen is you might get infinitely many solutions, okay? So there might be infinitely many different possible values for the Cs here. Okay, In that case, it's linearly dependent because if there's infinitely many solutions, in particular, there's at least one non-trivial non solution. There's at least one non-zero solution. Okay, and these are actually the only two possibilities. Remember, for linear systems in general, there are three possibilities, unique, infinitely many, or no solutions. But no solutions can't happen here because the zero solution is always a solution. You always have at least one. Okay, so the only possibilities are unique or infinitely many, corresponding to linearly independent and linearly dependent. All right, so let's go through sort of a less trivial example than the examples that we've gone through so far. So in three-dimensional space, is this set linearly dependent or independent? The set containing the vectors 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 3, and 3, 2, 1. All right, so the way that you solve this is set up the linear combination of these guys, set it equal to zero, and then solve for the coefficients. And then determine, hey, do I have infinitely many solutions or just one solution, the zero solution? All right, so this is the linear combination that we set up. Turn it into a linear system and solve it. Okay, so when we turn it into a linear system, what you do is you just match up uh, entries in the vectors, right? First entry on the left is C1 plus C2 plus 3C3, and that's got to equal 0. So that's our first equation. Second equation comes from the second entries in the vector, C1 plus 2C2 plus 2C3 equals 0. And third, uh, third equation comes from C1 plus 3C2 plus 1C3 equals 0, the third entry in the vectors. Okay, that's a system of linear equations. Throw it into an augmented matrix and solve it. Okay, so when we throw it into an augmented matrix, it looks like this, and now just get in row echelon form. Okay, so I start off by getting zeros down here in the bottom left corner. Then I get zeros down here in the bottom middle to get me a little bit closer to row echelon form. And now I'm in row echelon form. Okay, here's my leading entry. Here's another leading entry. And rows of zeros are all tucked away at the bottom. Okay, so you can double check that, that uh, arithmetic on your own if you want. Sort of nothing fancy happens there. It's all just adding and subtracting numbers from each other. All right, our conclusion from here is, well, remember, we want to determine is there a unique solution or are there infinitely many solutions? And well, how many solutions are there here? Well, we've got three variables. Remember, each column corresponds to a variable in the linear system. It corresponds to C1, C2, or C3. 
Here, C1 is a leading variable, C2 is a leading variable, but then, oh shoot, I don't have a leading entry down here. C3 is a free variable. C3 can be anything it wants to be. So in particular, we've got infinitely many solutions. Okay, so what that tells us, hey, there's infinitely many solutions. Oh, that corresponded to the set being linearly dependent. Okay, we don't necessarily care what the solutions are. We just care, you know, is there just one or are there infinitely many? That tells us linear dependence versus independence. If we actually wanted to find a linear combination of these guys that equals the zero vector to really convince ourselves that it's linearly dependent, we could do that from here, you know, just pick pick some value for, C, for C3 and then use back substitution to find C2 and then to find C1. And what that would give you is it would give you an explicit example of a linear combination that equals the zero vector, really demonstrating that, yeah, it's linearly dependent. Okay, and this is the method that you can use in general to check dependence or independence. What you do, if you wanna know, hey, this set containing V1 up to Vn, well, that's linearly dependent if and only if the linear system AX equals zero has a non-zero solution where A is the matrix that you get if you stick these vectors in as columns. Okay, and let's just go back to this previous example. You might not have noticed this when we went through this example here. What were the vectors that we started with? One, 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 two, three, and three, two, one. And then what we did is we turned that into a linear combination, then a linear system, and then a matrix. But you can sort of skip those intermediate steps. If you just take the three vectors here, one, 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 two, three, three, two, one, those become the columns down here, the columns of the matrix that you augment with zeros and solve, right? One, 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 two, three, three, two, one. And that will always happen. That's what this theorem says. You just take the vectors you care about that you're checking for dependence or independence, stick them in a matrix as columns, and then solve that matrix times X equals zero. All right, so that's all this theorem is saying. It's saying that you can sort of skip the intermediate step of constructing the linear combination, turning it into a linear system, and then turning it into a matrix. It's just when it gets turned into a matrix, it's always the same thing. It just has these vectors as its columns. All right, well, let's round out the week with just a couple of final notes about linear dependence and independence, to just, just to try to build up our intuition about it a little bit more. All right, so even though the definition of linear dependence, the way it was defined was, you know, some linear combination of those vectors equals zero, there's another equivalent way that we could have defined it if we wanted to, okay? And then the other equivalent way of defining it is as saying that at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set, okay? So at least one of the Vj's is a linear combination of all of the other Vs, okay? And the way to see that those two definitions are equivalent to each other is, well, this was the defin that was definition that was given to us up above, okay? Well, what I could do is note that, hey, if, if at least one of these is non-zero, then, well, okay, let's say Cj is the non-zero one. The jth coefficient is, is one of the non-zero ones. Then what I can do is I can solve for Vj in terms of all the other ones. Okay, I can just move everything else over to the other side. Okay, so this equation happens if and only if this equation down here happens, right? All that, all that I've done here is I've sort of plucked out the jth term here, moved all the other ones over to the other side. That's why I have minus signs in front of them. I, I moved them to the other side, right? Okay. And then I divided both sides by Cj. Okay. And when I do this like this, the point is this is a linear combination of the other vectors that gives me Vj. So, you know, at least one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other ones. Okay, and this is why I needed Cj to be non-zero. This is why I need at least one of the coefficients in that linear combination to be non-zero, so that I can actually get Vj itself as a linear combination of these other guys. So I can do this division by Cj. Okay, if all of these coefficients equal zero, then remember that's the trivial linear combination. That doesn't tell you linear dependence, and it also doesn't tell you that one of the vectors is a linear combination of the others, because you can't do this final division by a coefficient step. Okay, another useful trick that, to know is that if you ever have a set that contains the zero vector, no matter what else is in that set, if it contains the zero vector, you know right away that it's linearly dependent. Okay, apologies for the jump there. You know right away that it's linearly dependent. Okay, and the reason that you know that is, well, let's just consider a quick simple example. If you take a set like this that has the zero vector and then k other vectors, okay? It doesn't matter how many other vectors. Well, you can see that uh, that's linearly dependent because, well, here is a non-trivial linear combination of those vectors that gives you the zero vector. 
Okay, we stuck a three in front of the zero vector here, and then zeros in front of the, all the other ones. And it's okay to have zeros in front of all the other ones because there's this three in front of the first vector. Okay, and you only need at least one of the coefficients in the linear combination to be non-zero for it to count. Okay, so this linear combination here shows that the set is linearly dependent. Okay, and you can always do that if the zero vector is in your set. It's always going to show that it's linearly dependent. Geometrically, the way to think about linear de dependence is, well, sort of like we talked about how, okay, one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other ones, or equivalently, like you could toss away one of the vectors from the span without actually altering the span. So another way of thinking about this is you have k vectors and they all live in some common subspace of dimensions smaller than k, okay? So they sort of, they live in some subspace that's smaller than it should be in a sense. Okay, so for example, like if you have two vectors that lie on a common line, like they're both pointing in the same direction or opposite direction, that's an example of linear dependence, okay? One of them is a linear combination of the others. Like if you have two, two vectors in general, that should give you a plane. Like their span should be a plane if they're just sort of like pointing in random directions. But if they're both pointing along the same line, their span's going to be a line. And that's linear dependence. Another example, higher dimensions. If you have three vectors in three-dimensional space that all live on a common plane, that's again linear dependence. Okay, if you have three vectors in general, their span is just gonna, you know, give you all of three-dimensional space. But if their span only gives you a plane, like if all three of those vectors lie on a common two-dimensional plane, that's linear dependence. Okay, sort of their span is smaller than it should be in a sense. It's only two-dimensional, even though there's three of them. Okay, or even worse, if you had three vectors in three-dimensional space all living on a line, that's also linear dependence. It's sort of even more linearly dependent, right? All right, and a really quick and easy way to check that if you if you have a set with just two vectors, you can really quickly and easily check if it's linearly dependent or independent. Okay, for just two vectors, linear dependence means exactly that this, the vectors, they're scalar multiples of each other. Okay, so if you have a set with just two vectors and I ask you, is this dependent or independent? All I'm asking you is, are they multiples of each other or not? Okay, so just quick example to illustrate this point. Here's the set with two vectors. And then the question is, is it linearly dependent or independent? Okay, you just look at this vector over here and you notice that, hey, that vector there, it's minus three times the first vector. So yeah, they're multiples of each other. So linearly dependent. Okay, right? What if I mean if you if you've got vectors that are multiples of each other, then certainly they're linear combinations of each other, right? Linear combinations they're more general. All right, but it works the other way too, as long as your set has just two vectors. All right, so let's say the set with just these two vectors here. The question is, are those multiples of each other? So you look at this, and the first entry is minus three times the first entry here, but then the second entry here is double that entry there. So no, there's no common scalar multiple that you know, this vector times just a single scalar equals this vector over here. It doesn't work. They're not multiples of each other. So our conclusion is linearly independent, okay? The set is linearly independent. Okay, if your set has three or more vectors though, it's more complicated. Don't do it like this. Don't just ask if they're scalar multiples of each other. You have to do it the linear system way, okay? You throw the vectors as columns into a matrix, solve the linear system AX equals zero and ask how many solutions it has. Alrighty, so let's finish up today's lecture just with a final theorem. We're not gonna prove this theorem, but something that's useful to know. Yet again, there's a connection between invertibility of matrices and the topic that we just introduced, okay? And this time, so it's a connection between invertibility of matrices and linear independence, okay? And we're not gonna prove this again, but it's a useful fact to know, so just keep it in the back of your mind for now. A matrix is invertible if and only if its columns form a linearly independent set. So you take the n columns of that matrix, throw them into a set. If that set is linearly independent, it's an invertible matrix. If it's not linearly independent, in other words, if it's linearly dependent, then it's not an invertible matrix. And then, you know, the same exact thing happens for the rows, okay? Nothing special about columns here. You can do the same thing with rows. You throw those into a set, ask about linear dependence or independence, and that tells you about invertibility of the matrix. Okay, so this is very related to the theorem that we had at the end of the previous lecture video that dealt with columns of a matrix and spans of them being related to invertibility of the matrix, right? So if I just scroll back up a little bit here, okay, we saw this theorem last class where it was like the columns of a span Rn and the rows of a span Rn, those are equivalent to invertibility. Well, now we have the same thing with linear dependence or independence of the columns or rows.
Okay, so we've got a whole boatload of different characterizations of invertibility of matrices now. Okay, and which one you use just depends on which information about the matrix you actually have. Some of these characterizations are useful in some situations, whereas other characterizations are useful in others. Okay, but we'll start tying all of this together as we go forward from this week. Okay, so starting next week, we'll start seeing why all of these different things are useful and why all of these equivalences are really fantastic things to have. All right, so I'll see you soon for week eight.